what's going on right now of Native and Black people. It's, I mean, the fact that we are, are uh, classified, not even classified, but just put in this position that we are, we also have to just step forward and, and take ownership of how we're, it's not even about reparations. We, this is our this is a, our country this is our culture and we need to uh, step up and, and claim that before beginning this evening's program we would like to acknowledge that the land the old state house and the old south meeting house stand upon is the unceded occupied homeland of the massachusetts people we acknowledge that the state of massachusetts has been developed in the unceded occupied territory of the massachusetts Nipmuc and Wampanoag tribes, and we support them in their struggle. We honor and respect the many Native peoples who are connected to this place, past, present, and future. This evening's program joins together two thematic programming worlds. It was inspired by a desire to highlight Indigenous voices within the framework of a series Revolutionary Spaces has offered since last month, titled Poetry and Conversation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's featured artist, Robert Peters. Robert is a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, an artist and a writer. His collection of poetry, essays, and acrylic paintings that comprise the calendar 13 moons will be performed in its entirety in this evening's performance. Without further ado, Robert Peters. We're gonna be working tonight with a very talented group of readers slash performers. Um, Lynette Perdiz, Mixer Sean Rossi, Marsha Perla, and Morgan James Peters, also known as Moaline. And um, I, I thank you all for participating in this and helping make this a reality. 13 Moons is a collection of native art and poetry that evolved through my own personal journey to reclaim tradition, culture, and ultimately live life in a way that is consistent with my own traditional beliefs. We have very little control over essential things that we must have to complete our vision of what society should be. We need to be free to do things in ways that are consistent with <clears throat> the way we view the world. We are raised to interact with the environment, but spend most of our time living in a world that pushes the environment away. The task of conforming to another world's life requirements leaves little time to consider our own well-being let alone caring for Mother Earth. Most of us have little and many none, nothing left to contribute to our own family, tribal, and environmental well-being. It is fair for me to say we are not at home living in someone else's world. In this day of the, this age of coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and the things that brought that about, uh, the concept of home is extremely important and more important now. It is an essential concept. The idea of being home or going home exists in every human being, every culture, every village, every tribe, and every nation. Home is the sub subject of story and lore. It is voiced in every language, dialect, slang, even baby talk. Home exists within people spiritually. Every living being has a vision of what home is and means. Say it in English, home. Say it in your language, nikat, howl like a wolf. Say the word that you utter when you want to go home and you will feel in your heart that yearning. Shortly after 13 Moons was completed, this notion on the subject of home came to me. 
Home is to be in the place and time where you belong, not when that place and time is in the past, not when that place and time is in the future. When you are in the place and time where you belong now, then you are home. 13 Moons gives insight into my journey home so far. Her glow illuminates the nighttime world. Ever more brightly, she rises up, up, up into the open sky. The wolf howls at her arrival. Oh, 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 oh. Ever present, he understands the improbability of being with her. But he longs for her still, unwilling to comprehend impossible. He smiles inwardly, reflects back into the night and dreams. In the dreamer's dream, the dream world is of his making. It is the sacred space with no order or reason for existing other than the love they share, their medicine and their essence. In the dreamer's dream, love reigns and nothing else exists. In fact, love is the dream. Her glow casts over the world, soothing, invigorating, pulling his spirit until adrenaline's flow can be held no more. Brother Wolf bounds in her direction and howls out again. Oh, oh, oh. She embraces the dreamer and the dreamer's dream. She glows back warmly. Her smile beams everywhere. They are together once more. Entering the lodge is returning to the womb of Mother Earth. Rocks taken from a bed of coals and passed through the door are all ancestors. And we thank each one with a sprinkle of tobacco. And as the ancient ones are carefully placed in the center of the lodge, the fire keeper covers the entrance so that light exits, no light exits other than the ancestors' fading orange glow. Water poured over them, hisses and evaporates instantly into hot, hot steam that billows up and around, creating heat upon heat. In the darkness you endure, you pray, talk, sing, this is the first round of many that must be endured before exiting the lodge, rejuvenated and reborn. Thank you. 
I was a spiritual exile. The trees sent me away. They instructed me to live in the white man's world and not return until I achieved the kind of success that white men aspire to have. I had a white man job, ate white man food, and walked in white man shoes. Essentially, I was a white man. Not irreversibly or forever, but for a time. I was exiled from the forest, exiled from the waters, exiled from the sacred circle, and only returned to those places during brief interludes measured in white man time. I argued with the great spirit about this. I argued for years on end, in and out of many seasons, through the cycles of uncounted moons, but the great spirit remained silent and kept his silence, no matter how much I ranted and raved, until one day I stopped fighting and my restless spirit became quiet and still. Then, suddenly, only unperceivably, like a whisper, he began to show me things. He gave me insight, the ability to decipher my own experiences, to look, to see, to listen. His head is Africa, the cracks European divisions that torment still. Light from his mouth illuminates like the path as he pushes his way into view, telling his story in word and song. My ancestors come from China, the Philippines, Cuba, Spain, France, England, Massachusetts, Mali, Senegal, New Orleans, Mobile, Pasadena, the Choctaw Nation, North and South Carolina, Virginia, New York City. My ancestors are indigenous peoples, Taino and Arawak of the Caribbean, by way of Boriquen, Puerto Rico. African people by way of Central and West Africa, and of mestizaje from Portugal and Spain. My people of the Mashpee Wampanoag, my people are from the island of Barbados by way of Ghana and Nigeria and Senegal. My people come from Morocco. My people come from the Sudan. I'm of the Carib people as well. My people come from Quantucket River Valley, Cornwall, occupied Cornwall by the UK. People come from Guinea, West Africa. My people come from what was formerly known as Inner Mongolian. My ancestors come from Ghana, Mashpee, Aquina, England, Prince Edward Island, Sparta, Georgia, New Bedford, Netherland by way of Suriname, and from Mattapan. <laughs> When we lived in Wampanoag time, the day began when the sun's light reached the colorful clay cliffs at Aquina 
and Masha peacefully smoked his pipe. Now time is told from Greenwich, England. If anything at all, Greenwich meantime is where the night began. As you contemplate the universe, the universe contemplates you, you meditate, you dissipate, you drift with the wind, you flow with the water, you sink, you soar, you salivate, eyes closed, you see hands reaching, giving, taking, fixing, breaking, building through the mind's eye. You see the world, it's all parts. In the shadow of greatness, the impoverished wait to rise up out of the poverty. The power wait for more power. The air waits to become wind and the sea waits to boil over. All the while the universe looks back unmoved by feeble attempts to achieve what no man is meant to do. You are a pebble dropping in water. You are ripples pushing outward. You are a leaf falling. You are back. Back from a brief waking dream. Everything is exactly the same but different. A red sun is rising, lifting with the red people, lifting the spirits that live in the land. Ancestors emerge from trees, rocks, and water. <clears throat> Birds, fish, and four-legged ones are watching, listening, and sensing. The red sun rise. They hold out their hands and wings and fins and rejoice at their return to places once called home. High above the noise of civilization, the hawk glides effortlessly. Far below, a lone wolf makes her way through city streets tentatively. Grass pushes through concrete because there is a small crack and there is light, and there is hope. There is a red sun rising through the trees and the clouds, up, up, up into the sky, shedding furious light onto the land, sending darkness, darkness into shadow, up, 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 until even shadow has no place to go. The red sun is rising. Red people, come running, come dancing, come sing. Red sun rising. Is it so surprising we are still here? dark nights of winter become spring nights and continue to wane every day. The cold becomes distant memory. Flowers bloom, eggs hatch, and the fish run. The same is true in positive thought. Reason emerges from chaos incrementally until wisdom once again is the rule. It is the back, it is the thoughtful mind that rakes the coals, that fires the soul, 
to make men whole. The summer solstice is coming. Summer solstice is especially unique because it is potentially the brightest time that there is or ever could be. If there are no clouds, if it is not raining, if your eyes are open, if your spirit is clear, summer solstice can be the brightest time you ever know. I have no absolute thoughts about rage against the machine, except that the painting speaks to our clashes with nature and to our so human denial of the fact that everything we do, everything we think, and all that we are is nature. I almost painted over this one several times. A crow in the cupboard is never good. The dodo birds woke me up this morning, a little after three. It was the notion of their flight that roused me from my sleep. My dreams turned into thoughts and my mind began to churn. I thought about how they were hunted to extinction and found myself between worlds. I contemplated how these things were related. I looked at myself and realized I have always walked between worlds, between the white world, the black world, and the red world between the spirit and flesh, between ideals and philosophies, between disputes, between people. The world I envision to one day be my own is also a world between worlds, between the ancestors and future generations. I envision myself and others like me taking what we can salvage from the past, what exists now and what we dream to create a place for ourselves unto itself. This is the world I want for my children. In my experiences, I have come across many things that make my mind spin. I have seen changes that make no sense, yet people walk that path. They ride, they drive, they fly, until the path is no longer a path, but a highway. The highway connects to bigger highways, to cities and airports, connected by unseen channels that enable anyone to communicate with everyone everywhere but no one listens. So what about these dodo birds? What do they mean to me? In my world, different because they're not here. What? Would the highways go to other places? Would we be better off if we let the dodo birds live? Hmm. The creator created one place on earth without violence, without predators, without creatures, had no concept of peril. I closed my eyes and pointed backwards through time into infamy and frowned at the scene. Men came. They killed the dodo bird and harvested their eggs. They roasted and basted, cooked them on open fires. They made souffles and omelets and dodo pate, grabbing them up 10 at a time. Until one day when they were fat from gluttony and lazy beyond reason because the fruit from the land dropped out of the trees into their hands still picking their teeth from the last dodo feast, poised to roll over and reach for another, only to discover the dodo was no more. Mm -hmm. When you stand at the edge of the abyss and there's nothing there staring you back, that is where a man finds his character. Take a trip with me, even though the journey's begun. 
We're all born to free will and keep going till we're done. Passions released or oh, released, we'd like to think there's a message in the bottle that said, Don't take a drink. Take a bite of the apple and your mind might expand. Consciousness exposes you to a master plan. Have knowledge yourself, and they'll chalk it up to vanity. Let them know your thoughts, and they'll question your sanity. When you stand at the edge of the abyss, and there's nothing there staring you back, that is where a man finds his character. Choices you make will shape who you become. Places you end up as opposed to where you're from. Now if you make changes to your karma, you'll rewrite divine drama. See, I was always glad to be one who had a dad. Now I'm the kind of dad I always wished I had. As the legacy brings, a new legacy will bring. A new landscape through and through. Or is it really just new to you? Oh, when you stand at the edge of the abyss and there's nothing there staring you back, that is where a man finds his character. His character, his character. <laughs> That's where a man finds his character. That's where he finds his character. and sky meet where the pipe and stem come together and always you always make an offering to the four directions mother earth and the creator could take me no further. With a small splash, I disappeared. I could see the ripples pushing outward in my wake and feel the coolness of the water. I could see the trees and the sun and felt its warmth. I was as if I was everywhere.
We lit a medicine fire for 10 years. There was medicine in the thoughts and events that made us decide to, de made us decide to light the first one. I traveled to Mashpee to talk it over with different people in the tribe. Everyone agreed it was a good idea to light the fire, that we needed it. But they all seemed unusually troubled too. First, I stopped to see Lenny Pocknett. He was distant and he didn't say much at all, but he nodded to the idea of lighting the fire. When I visited cousin Ramona, she sighed and said she was sad and also troubled because she couldn't say why she was so sad. In spite of her sadness, perhaps, because of it, she supported the idea of lighting the fire. Then I went to the tribal council meeting to discuss lighting the fire with several people there. They also liked the idea of lighting the fire. A few people agreed to be fire keepers. The consensus was yet, was yes, but everyone there also seemed more quiet, sad, and distant. I returned to Boston that night with us having established that for nine days in November, we would keep a fire lit from the first quarter moon to the full moon. I was happy for what was accomplished, but worried a bit about the sadness in the air. The following night, I climbed into bed with plenty of time to get a good night's sleep before going to my job operating subway trains. After only a few minutes in bed with no thought at all, I picked up the phone and called in sick. I had no reason to do this. I knew I would get in trouble for doing so, but there was no way I was going into work. Every fiber of my being said no. In the morning, I woke up in good spirits, happy with my decision not to go to work. I picked up the phone and invited Chris Banks over for coffee and went back to sleep. The ringing of the doorbell woke me up. Chris was outside yelling, we're being attacked. We're being attacked. When I opened the door, he rushed me up the stairs yelling, quick, turn on the TV. A passenger jet just hit the World Trade Center. We're being attacked. The TV came on to show the World Trade Center towers smoking from a gaping hole in the upper floors. As we watched in stunned amazement and horror, a second plane ripped through the other tower. The explosion caused a stream of fire to shoot out the far side of that building. We watched the towers burning, people waving out of broken windows. We tensed up in horror when they climbed into the window frames and jumped to certain death, resolute about their decision to die. Our hearts stopped beating when the first tower collapsed into itself and neatly crumbled to the ground, not like an elevator, but like a fist, pulverizing everything in its violent path. We watched the people running to escape the billowing plume of smoke and debris that pushed out in all directions, overcoming everything. We watched people emerge from the settling plume covered whitely with ash and dust like ghosts emerging from a nightmare. I sat on the couch for the next three days and did nothing but watch. My trip to Mashpee was all also on my mind. It seems as if we all knew something was about to happen. No one could say what it was but we felt it coming.
these people are my people. They have our faces and our mannerisms. They walk like us. They run like us. They fight like us. They share our vision. They love the land just like we do because they are us. Honor Bee was inspired by three things. The first inspiration came when I sat and practiced with a drum, a new drum, a new drum at the time called Eastern Sun. It was 2001. And on the drum, it was their custom to charge a dollar every time a drummer missed a beat. So after I lost an, enough money and my dollar bills were tied all over the drum, I backed up my chair and just watched. The way they worked their voices made me feel like their vocal cords would come right out of their necks. After studying this for a long time, I decided the drum was a good subject to paint. At first, I worked quickly and made good progress. But the second inspiration to the honor beat caused a creative impasse that made me stop working. In the spring of 2001, I visited the site of the Great Swamp Massacre, where Pometa Comet and his warriors were defeated. I walked around the dirt road that circled crudely circled crudely cut granite pillars that marked the scene of the defeat of my people. It was a moving experience to stand there knowing the attack that took place and what it meant to us. We decided to make an offering to our fallen ancestors. We had sage to burn, but no matches to light the sage. It was getting dark and the surrounding swamp was alive with unseen animals beyond the thickness of trees and plant life. Sadly, we started to leave without burning, <clears throat> burning sage or making an offer, offering. But at the top of the circle, a book of matches was on the ground. It was as if we were not supposed to leave this place without making an offering. When I went home, I discovered that a spirit, spirit must have hitch, hitched a ride. In the middle of the night, I opened my eyes and he was two inches in front of my face as if <clears throat> this was the only time I had ever actually seen a spirit. I was amazed but remained calm and felt no fear. When the spirit realized my eyes were opened, it became frightened and bugged out and flew right through me and through the back of my house. About a week later, I took my children to a memorial for my uncle John, Slow Turtle. He was the beloved Supreme Medicine Man of the Wampanoag Nation. 
I must have accidentally taken a picture while I was still at home. When I developed the film, one of the pictures revealed two spirits. The spirit that came with me in the foreground, speeding through the den. The face of an elder spirit filled the pantry window. Apparently, the elder spirit came to bring the mischievous spirit back to the great swamp. For about a month after that, after I intersected with the spirit, when I slept, I was in cool blue light, like the first light filtering through trees and morning mist. The light was in my dreams or half dreams because I always seemed to be half awake. I was aware of my dreams and seemed to be able to enter and exit my dreams at will. When I opened my eyes and looked around the dark room, I could still feel the soothing, cool blue light all around me. When I closed my eyes, I was back in my half dream, blue light, mist like all around me. Somehow, the blue light was connected to my painting. I could not continue work until I understood how they were related. So the honor beat sat untouched for three years. The third inspiration came when I was a firekeeper at the 2004 Medicine Fire at 55 Acres in Mashpee. The moon was full and it was very warm and windy. And this was strange because people called me on their devices and complained about how cold it was where they were in the surrounding towns. The cold air meeting warm air must have created the strong winds. I could hear wind coming from a long way off before it blew past and the sound of the wind trailed off into the distance. After a while, I began to notice on the tail end of the wind, I heard singing. At first, I thought I was hearing distant voices, but then Listening more carefully, I realized the singing could only be heard trailing the wind or other sounds like distant cars or planes. It was as if the voices were riding the wind, as if they could not exist on their own. I observed this for a long time. It continued for nearly an hour. With every gust of wind came far off singing. It was like the wind opened a window to the spirit world allowing voices to pass through. I was keeping the fire all alone that night and I'm sad that no one experienced this with me. I think the ancestors let their voices be heard because we honored them by keeping the fire, our prayers and making offerings of sage, tobacco and cedar and sweet grass. The spirit world sang out to me, it was a blessing. After about a month, I started painting again. There were no more impasses. All of the drummers are spirits. The drum is the universe. The four hands in the middle are the medicine wheel. The hand at the bottom is the spirit world. The drummer with his beater high above his head is about to deliver the honor beat. When I was in the blue light, I experienced strange and wonderful things that are too numerous to mention in this context. But there is one thing I should mention. One night, I was awakened by the thought of something I wrote when I was a transit union steward years earlier. These words surfaced in my mind and wouldn't go away. Politics, politics, politics. I couldn't remember anything else but this word three times. It was urgent for me to find out why it was so important. In the middle of the night, I got up, went into the attic, and started sifting through a pile of small notebooks, all bent from being carried in my back pocket when I was a union steward. I flipped through the pages on the, of the book, after book, after book, back through time until I found what I was looking for. It was an unfinished thought that I had written in my notes and forgot about. 
It read, politics, politics, politics. There are politics of nations, politics of religion and finance, and politics of the human spirit. Although I didn't mean it that way when I wrote it, in this reality, while I was in the blue light, that phrase only had one meaning. There are politics in the spirit world, just like we have politics in our own world. Evidently, these politics sometimes intersect and carry forward. When the blue light finally faded and went away, I was exhausted and experienced withdrawal. It took a great deal of energy to walk in our world and the spirit world at the same time. The medicine fire in 2006 was a punishing fire, punishing rain, punishing wind, punishing smoke. The rain came with us at first light. First it was light, then it was steady, then heavy, and never stopped being heavy after that. The wind came. We had the lodge for shelter, but the fire in the lodge got restless and wouldn't keep still. We adjusted the door and the smoke hatch, but after a long battle that lasted into the night, the smoke and rain prevailed and we were driven from the lodge. Outside, the wind made the medicine fire into a furnace that constantly needed to be fed to battle the wind and rain. The largest, soggiest, unsplit logs went into the fire defiantly, but after just seconds in the inferno, burst into flames. Just before midnight, the winds died down and I moved to my car. Tired and weak, I broke my fast sooner than I intended. My eyes burned, my hands were chapped and dry. I couldn't see to drive. When someone drove me, we found no stores open to buy eye drops for, to ease my aching eyes. The rain stopped around 2 a.m. I could see the stars in the sky. I was too weak and tired to say a prayer and too fearful of painful smoke getting into my eyes to enter the lodge to get my tobacco so I could make an offering. To be truthful, at that moment, I had nothing to offer. At first light, <clears throat> the fire was a pile of red coals and unburnt ends of logs that I pulled together and rekindled. I burnt sage and smudged the circle and the lodge. The fire in the lodge appeared to be completely out, but I found one ember smaller than a penny took a fist full of twigs, blew on it, and rekindled that fire too. I found the smallest log in the wood stack because the fire was still tiny. But when I tried to split that little log, it gave me a hard time, demonstrating how the smallest thing can give you the most trouble. This made me think about us. That little log was like us. The white man was done with us a long time ago. But look, we are still here. A day earlier at the first light, the smudge stick wouldn't light. The ends were loose and spread apart like fingers. I found a piece of hemp and used it to pull the loose strands of sage together and tied them into a tight bundle. The smudge stick lit after that and I realized the smudge stick was also like us. Our fire won't burn unless we come together. That medicine fire was a punishing fire, but it stayed lit. It was a sign of punishing times. I was driven from the lodge to be shown that we cannot go back to the ancient ways, but we must keep them, we must use them, expand upon the knowledge the ancient ones have passed down through generations. Use the knowledge given to you in your dreams. Look for the things the creator is trying to show you. It is time for us to use the gifts that we have, the gift of spirit that you can lose, but no one can take away, the gift of insight 
We see things most people can't, but to often ignore what we are shown. The gift of unity. We are fragmented, but never stop wanting. After all this time, we still want to be our own people. The gift of hope, the gift of prayer and laughter and compassion are all things that we still have. Things we must use and share and let go of when it is time to pass our gifts on to the next generation. This is why we are here now, why we were here yesterday and why we will be here tomorrow. With the gifts the creator has given us, we are forever. As we conclude this meditation on indigenous life, it is necessary to add one more story. At Hassan Amisset, it rained so much on that first day that in the morning, the wheelbarrow was filled to the rim with water. When I walked by, a spirit whispered to me, clear as day, you need to empty that wheelbarrow. I frowned at the wheelbarrow and refused the spirit's advice. No, that wheelbarrow isn't hurting anyone. Without another thought, I arrogantly continued along my way. Later that afternoon, when the encounter was long forgotten, I entered a competition splitting logs. I set up five logs upright, split them all, one after the other, one strike each. Then I handed the ax to Randy Josephs as I boasted about my feet. See that? I split mine, top that. Randy excitedly took the ax in his grip as I set six logs upright for him to split. Randy began swinging with such force that the logs flew apart as the ax crashed through. Without pause, he raised the ax over his head and behind his back with each crushing stroke, causing me to reel back to get out of the way as he rolled out at a quickening pace in a widening arch with each log split. In turn, I rolled back and back and back until I fell backwards directly into the wheelbarrow, still filled to the rim with water. Top that, laughed Randy Josephs. I feel like Jesus when I tell that story. I fell into the wheelbarrow so you don't have to. Shadows push away from her brilliant silverish blue glow, measuring the distance between one moment and the next. Brother Wolf cries out, hopefully, every time she crosses the sky, longing for her to be with him again. Finally, she sets and the lady slippers and the box berries gather round just to see how she shines back at him. So radiantly, her smile is everywhere. Yes, my love, I am here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was so beautiful, I uh, have to say. Um, it's just so wonderful. I feel so spoiled because I've gotten to now watch um, watch at least most of this at least a couple times through and listen to it. And it's so wonderful because every time I feel like I'm I'm noticing things that I didn't notice the last time. There's just so much to see and listen to, and um, it's wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, so we're going to transition to some uh, discussion questions now, and. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I was, um, I'd like to kind of open with. So uh, just a, um, uh, Rob, for Robert, uh, if you could maybe share a little bit about how, I know that this calendar is something that you worked on over uh, quite a long period of time, but I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit about how the idea of bringing these things together into, into the calendar and, um, and the, the concept for the calendar came to you. Um, and then kind of a secondary question of, to that, uh, which you can 
you might want to answer separately, I don't know, is, um, is what, in, in terms of your vision for it, what do you hope that both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people will take from your calendar? Um, it's always evolving what this calendar means. Uh, there are certain things that, you know, didn't seem to fit, you know, five years ago um, that make sense right now, um, which comes to why, how I started the calendar. Um, I retired from the MBTA in 2007. And I think like on one of my last days working, um, I, I was, I'm also a, a DJ and um, I was in the New England DJ Association and Eddie Q. Matthews, the runner of the uh, owner of the uh, DJ Association at the time, had this big canvas, eight feet by four feet, and he gave it to me. So the first thing I did upon retirement was started painting exile. And over the course of painting that painting, it occurred to me that I should do a calendar for 2015. And I started working on the paintings. And it took me seven years to make all of those paintings. And the only one that was painted before that was the honor beat, um, which also is drawn into this, like all of the poetry. So when I finished the paintings, I started going through poetry I had written over the years and put them into the calendar, mainly as a balance, to balance with the pictures, but they seem to fit just right. And uh, there's a little bit of an explanation in the latter poetry, um, but I think part of what driv drove me to do this was there, there, there was some elements of clairvoyance where I knew we would be in this time that we're in now when I was 16 years old. And the woods by the Mashpee River is where I got that insight and those meditations. So uh, hopefully that answers uh, your question. Thank you. Um... So, um, uh, in, in talking about the calendar, um, sometime in one of our recent conversations, I think, um, you said something to the effect of, in, in telling our own stories, we're taking back some of our own power. And I wonder if you could say something about this, um, because there's definitely a lot of a lot of um, uh, kind of different ways of bringing up the idea of power um, and empowerment in in some of these poems and, and paintings um, and thinking about uh, like the, the red sun is rising, the poem about the red sun rising and um, the, the rage against the machine painting and the, the little commentary on that. Um, if you could maybe say something about how 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 does this taking back of power happen and do you see that do you see a balance of power shifting today um it's taking back our power when we come together amongst ourselves and in this case not even physically we've come together through technology um which is ironic because people of color, Native Americans, especially, and African Americans, are really in the technological dark ages compared to what the average white person has in their house. You know, they, they have 3D printers, and I don't know anybody that has a 3D printer except Mal King. <laughs> but, um, you know, for us to come together and share our stories and share our intellect, we do take back our power. Anytime that we get together and organize something or arrange something or arrange to help somebody, we are taking back power. Even as we're giving, we're taking back that power. Would you, 
would you be willing to say something about specifically about the um, rage against the machine painting because you were chatting with me about that a little bit um, I think on the phone maybe a week or so ago and um, I was interested I, I thought it might be interesting especially because a lot of the people here are likely just seeing seeing those paintings just one time and you you um, oh and thank you um, and we, we can see it here now um, would would you be willing to uh, just say a little bit about that because I know it took me a while to to kind of take in all of the various elements of of the painting well um, it's really very interesting um, that uh, and, and this painting was directed to be July. Uh, and what makes it July uh, is that the things falling out, uh, there's tea bags and there's seven tea bags, which is July. And on the floor, there's 20 tiles that you can see a part of. And any, anybody who's ever done, uh, am I not a robot? you know, looking for, you know, traffic lights or whatever, know how that the rules are to that. Um, so it does speak to July 2020. Um, and if you look inside of the cover, if we could blow that up a little bit, I don't know if you can. Um, you see um, Uncle Ben is in the cover and uh, Mrs. Butterworth is in the cover. And I didn't have Aunt Jemima because I couldn't put Aunt Jemima and Mrs. Butterworth into the same cover. Uh, but uh, these are things that in recent weeks have come up. Uh, that, that They say they're going to change or discontinue uh, Aunt Jemima and come up with another icon for that. Um, and Uncle Ben, uh, they're not going to portray him as this old uh, slave, this old trustworthy slave. Um, so, you know, it's ironic that these things are, are falling. Um, and you see there's a window. Um, uh, and before I mention that, I should say that a crow in the cupboard is never a good thing. Um, in, in our town uh, in Mashpee, when I was growing up, they, if, a, if a bird got in the house, they said, somebody's gonna die. Um, so the crow in the cupboard is not good. And there's a window. And that window is our opportunity. That's our opportunity to do something. And I just heard Dr. Falke say, we have a window. And this picture says, we have a window. I will, I guess I'll just take you in the order that I see you here. And I think we've got, I see three people right now up. Um, it, so when I, when I invite you and just say your, your name, if you could just unmute yourself and everybody else stay muted until we're ready. And then um, let us know what your question is. And if you're asking it of a particular, um, member of the group or just opening it up to anybody who would like to reply. Um, so how about, could we hear from Orly? Well, first of all, I just want to say I have loved listening to all of you. You're so creative. I have thirsted to know more about Native American culture. I, I used to read Native American books when I was growing up and in some sense, I almost feel like it was um, in my heritage somewhere or a past life or something because I've always been drawn to it. But so it's been so beautiful to listen to your music, the art, the poetry. Um, and one of the questions I had for Mikashan was the three pronged wooden instrument that you played. And I hope I said your name right. Uh, so forgive me if I haven't pronounced it correctly, but uh, the sound was so rich and kind of deep. So I was wondering, what type of instrument is that? Well, that's a, a cording flute. It's a contemporary cording flute. Uh, three of them uh, bound together. It was a gift to me from uh, this, uh, great artist, uh, William Parker. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
because I usually don't play card and flutes, but the three pronged one, I, I, I dug that. So that's what yeah. it is. Yeah, it was very beautiful. And one other question I have is, um, do any of you say your poetry in the in your native language? Do you write in your native language or speak poetry in your native language? I um I know very little of my language. I've gone to some classes and stuff, but we do have a generation of young people that have learned the language uh, immersion. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the the language was preserved uh, through Bibles, uh, mm. ironically, because you know it was the 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 colonization and it was the mighty arm of the army but it was also the arm of the church which uh, guided uh, uh, part of our, our culture being stripped from us um, so I uh, have written a book a children's book uh, called baby ma shop and it is one of our legends um, and a take that I had on that legend that came to me. Um, I don't even like to say that I, I thought this story up. It's a story that came to me. It was given mm -hmm. to me. Um, and the language program, the Wampanoag language program, is translating it into the language. Oh, wow. And my, my instructions to them was, don't write it verbatim. Write it how it makes sense. Mm -hmm. in our language because there's a lot of things that can't be said um in uh the english terms that don't translate to wampanoag terms um, mm -hmm. so i want to i want to hear how it sounds by using the terms that are relevant to us mm -hmm. which is another example of taking back power mm. that's beautiful thank you and i i just want to commend all of you i when I heard Lynette's poem about about the in the spirit, the insights, the unity to the hope, I it just brought to me how resilient Native American people are. So I really honor that in all of you, and really, I I think we need more of this uh, through WGBH and also in in other avenues here in New England. It would be beautiful. So thank you. Lynette, you did a great job on that poem. <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, did you want to say something, Lynette? I mean, it's an honor to read Robert's poems. I mean, you know, the feelings that he comes, um, the words, the expression, it touches all of us in some place, no matter where we're from. And the whole theme of home, coming back home, you know, it hits a lot of resonance. As Rob and I have had a lot of conversations, I've always lived near water and doing my ancestry and DNA, I find out my ancestors did come from Massachusetts. So I'm back on the Cape. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Um, let's, uh, Gloria, would you like to ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, I had a question for Robert because you had said you called in sick and I was just curious to know what you think would have happened if you hadn't called in sick that day. Um, it would have been another sort of a nightmare. It would have been a nightmare of just being put on your train and kept there all day and not knowing what was going on. Um, it's it's interesting because the the I never intended to be a subway driver, you know, I, and I always said, ah, I'm, I'm going to be gone in five years. I'm just going to hang around here for a minute. But I ended up doing my whole career there. Um, and, you, you know, there are times where they just take you and put you on your vehicle and forget about it. Um, and I would have never called in sick after finding that out, I would have stayed on my train and did what I was supposed to do. But I was meant to be sitting on my couch watching that. 
Um, and I think, you know, something tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, hey, wait a sec, you know, there's something more important you have to do than go in and drive trains. You know, whether I'm there or not, somebody's going to do that trip. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it's just, I think it, I connected more with this land and I connected more with my, uh, my loyalty to my own people and my own family and you know needed needed to be there to try to figure out what this meant and not that i did not um nobody did um but we're still learning and even with this calendar you know there are things i'm still learning about you know um uh what was written uh in um in the poem uh wake and dream the end of it never made sense to me. And, you know, it, it didn't make sense at the time. Everything is exactly the same, but different. Um, but now you fast forward to April 2020, you know, when we all got locked down, all right, everything was exactly the same, but different. You know, so so you that you don't know what's going to come out of this. You know, you don't know what insights that uh, will pop through. Um, but th and, and that's why I like to say, you know, that some of these things I, I didn't really write; they were given to me. Um, so uh, I hope that answers, you know, uh, most of your question. <laughs> I have one more question to follow up, and that is: Did you listen that time? Was that before or after the wheelbarrow incident? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I don't always listen, you know, and listening is a discipline um, that everybody could have, you know, um, and like listening to what's happening to us now, you know, and I think um, like with this whole Corona thing, you know, we really need to listen to what the creator is saying to us. And we need to look at what we just left. And like people are worried and scared about, you know, what's going to happen and whether the, the, the economy is going to do well. But I don't think anybody wants to go back to the world we just left. You know, so um, the, I think the creator is talking to everybody and everybody needs to listen. And that's probably one of the um, uh, not unintended, but uh, inadvertent uh, uh, roles of this calendar. Um, could we, uh, Karen, would you like to unmute yourself now and ask it your question? Hello, everyone. So. Hey, Karen. It's good to see you, my brother. So I just wanted to uh, give a warm thank you, um, you know, for, to Robert for welcoming me into the territory of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. Um, blessed to be part of one of those small fires uh, back in 2009. Um, I'm speaking here from the Lenape Hill King, my homeland and uh, near one of our ancient villages. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my question really kind of echoes what, you know, you sort of already started to say, you know, what, what are, and this could be to Robert, but also anybody else, you know, what are practices, what are ways that we can make this sort of seeking of visions, um, you know, continue to go forward and build from the ashes of this year. Um, I see a, how much that we're in sort of a crossroads so similar to what happened before. Um, and, you know, anything else you wish to share on that means a lot to me. Um, there's a verse I was thinking of, Robert, while you were speaking today. It's from one of the, the old prophets in the Bible, but I think the most powerful thing about these visions and these messages are that, you know, they, they speak to us across time in different ways, just like you said. Um, but there's, there's a passage from Jeremiah, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths, seek where the good way lies and walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. And I just want to give thank you to all of you for, um, you know, being so open to these thin places and also being teachers to those of us who come from far off lands and are blessed to live here in your homelands. Um, and we, we're grateful for any opportunities to continue to be part of that process of rebuilding things in places of ashes. So, oh, and Anashik, as we say in the Lenape language, and uh, Katapatush, my brother. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Kieran, hello. Kieran is one of oh. my. Uh, hello, somebody talking? Oh, 
Yeah, I was gonna answer this question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. But I can I can segue in after. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, as Robert was saying, the uh, lockdown that we've just experienced has been a period of contemplation. When you think about winter in the longhouse, that's what that was. That was that was our time away. That was our time for introspection. And um, what happens with with crisis many times is we don't take the time for introspection. We we want to we want to bounce back immediately, despite whatever it is that we've experienced. And sometimes it is just that no stop and think. And it's it's the um, you know they speak of the image of the phoenix rising from the ashes. <clears throat> you have to think of the fact that for there to be ashes, the fire had to stop burning for a time before there were ashes for a phoenix to rise from. So there is you know it's not that all of a sudden the fire stops. So right now, if you will, we're sitting in the time of the ashes. After this, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna speak a moment on Karen. Um, but I, after this, I want to have all of the readers tell a little bit about them, themselves. Um, and, and you all did a wonderful job. And, uh, and Erica and uh, the GBH family, thank you too. Um, now, Karen, um, I met through, you know, my my interaction with my own community. He participated in some of our medicine fires. Um, and he's one of my dearest friends. Um, and what you, what you don't know by looking at him is he is a master of divinity. Uh, he, he graduated from Harvard School of Divinity. And he's one of the most uh gentle spirits where animals will just come up to him like and uh everything loves him um and he he's a good person through and through that has always been there with us in in our struggle and always has walked with that open mind and i thank you so much for that uh and um you, you know you you're definitely uh, a warrior uh, for, for, for peace and love and moving forward into a better world. Thank you, my brother. Um, Robert, we, uh, we still have, there's, I think, two or three other people that are um, interested in asking a question. Could we, could we try to take maybe a couple more audience questions? And um, I think we have time okay yeah I, I just want to at some point you know give give the proper acknowledgement to the readers but we can ask a few more questions um let's see who was i who do i see next i think uh how about liza liza you're next in my lineup do you want to unmute sure thanks so much um i just wanted to say how much i really appreciated the the creativity and grace that each of you brought to tonight. Um, I really give thanks for that. Um, these are very tough times and to hear the artistry and then the ways in which you express yourselves have been just really moving for me. And I'm wondering if each of you who spoke tonight or played your instrument could share with us the mode of expression that you find most, I don't know, effective or meaningful for you or what mode of expression really speaks to you that you like the most to get your ideas, your feelings and your place on this world out to other people. Thanks. It's people ask me that all the time, especially kids to say, uh, what's your favorite instrument? What's your favorite song? you know, in adults, you know, we get more articulate. What's your favorite mode of expression? And really the answer is all of it. It just depends on when. It's just like that old saying goes, you know, people tell you when you're playing music, you know, some some old school teachers will say, don't play, you know, you can play in a wrong note. The way I learned music, there is no wrong note. There is no wrong time to do something. It, but 
there's, well, there's no wrong note, but it's the timing. It's all in the timing. And, you know, my favorite mode of expression now in the summertime, depending on, on what my mood is, would be the flute, singing. I've been singing and playing the blues a lot lately. But uh, other times, it could be a saxophone, drumming, singing. And that's why I play so many different instruments, because it depends on what motivates me at that moment. Because time is is now, like Robert was saying a little earlier, you know, we're not in the past, we're not in the future, it's now. Now is the time, and so at that moment, I was playing my favorite mode of expression and my favorite instruments. So I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Robert, cousin Andy. Andy, how are you? Love you, uh, man. Fine, I wanna let everybody know that uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Robert's cousin. I've known him since he's a little boy. And I've always wanted to ask this question. Uh, you see the smile on his face, don't everybody? And he's always to us been known as the happy, happy warrior. And my house, Robert, is filled with your paintings. It's filled with your books, the Cookie Monster, your paintings when people are leaving the Boston Garden. They're all comical figures. When you're leaving the ice cream place, your son drops his ice cream cone on the ground. This humor, I've always wanted to ask you, I've never seen any of your paintings, drawings, artwork, books. It's, they're always filled with humor. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, looking at, you're, when you look at me, you're looking at yourself, Andy, because you are filled with humor too. And if you look at our our, our family and our relatives, you know we we laugh at things. We 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 smile. We we want to smile. Um, uh, Walim Walim is, uh, is 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 a humorous guy, but his father, Randy Randy Peters you know, was a, a man full of humor. And um, we love to laugh. I think that's why we embrace humor so it, much. It, it's not, it, it's not, but it's and. Get your conjunctions correct. <laughs> Grammar rock here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Andy, Andy, when you ask that question, you're talking about yourself. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, to, to, to jump back a question, because I don't think we all got to answer it. Um, likewise, the art is of the moment. I'm, I vacillate between music and writing. And um, writing is an extension of my work in storytelling and uh, oral tradition and trying to capture history. But what, you, what also you find is that you capture the philosophy and the uh, values, the ethics of the people in the storytelling. So considering the times that are going on now, this is time that's ripe for storytelling because so many of our ethics and our, and our values are being tested um, with almost every breath we take. Now, what also happens with our storytelling, our storytelling as, as my teacher, Nick Sashan, um, just stated about he's in the mode of the blues. Well, of course, the blues and the blues is that crossroads storytelling because the blues is what happens when Native people jam with African people. It's the music of Ghana blended with the music of the Choctaw and the Cherokee and the um, Tuscarora people. So when you hear the blues, you're hearing um, all you're hearing this really incredible multicultural um, stew, so to speak. And the blues is our storytelling. The blues are our stories that traveled up through the cedar swamps. And the blues are the stories that now that the cedar swamps are paved over and turned into Highway 84 and 95 and 195 and 495, you know, our stories are flowing again. So our stories, you know, our blues are gonna come back. Our soul music is gonna come back. We're listening to it in our hip hop. 
um, the, you know, our stories are being told and our stories are flowing. So they're going to go back and forth between the spoken word and the sung word and every way that it can be communicated. I hope that answers the question as well. But I want to add something because Andy in inspired uh, a future story that I, I hope to write one day and illustrate. Um, and you and your brother Randall were, when my family fell on hard times, my grandfather was uh, a lawyer um, back around the turn of the century. And he, um, he was a, 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 one of the founders of the Niagara Movement. But uh, he got ill and we f fell on to hard times. And I, I imagine it was because the house was lost. Um, they wanted to get the grandfather clock from that house to the house where they moved to. So Randall and Andy bought the clock across New Bedford in a wagon. Do you remember that? You, you brought the, you were, you were Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Randy and Andy bought the um, grandfather clock. And your brother uh, Randall told me that story before he passed. Um, and I really embrace that. And I, and I need for you to help me write that. So uh, somebody has to unmute Randy, Andy. <laughs> um, can we get him unmuted? I, I, I heard you, Robert. And I'd be glad to, okay? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think we had, um, uh, we have one other person who was waiting to ask a question. Is there anyone else who would like to answer the, the question that, um, that Liza asked about kind of your favorite um, mode of expression? I can jump on that. Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, I'm a dancer and I'm a choreographer. So that's my mode of expression. Um, I have a dance company that's Organica and um, I grew up in Puerto Rico. So I, I, my, my roots are in the drums and in the maraca and in like, so that, that's my, my initial, when I think about expressing myself, it's always through the body first. Um, and that's how, why I became a choreographer. Um, I also write poetry and um, we do dance theater through the company. So um, yeah, I would say that dance is the way that my, my feelings come right out through movement. Uh, I also just saw in the um, Q and A that you were mentioning that you also write your native language Spanish and that you're you're also learning uh, the Taino language? Yeah, so my first language is Spanish and then um, in the Caribbean, very much so like here, um, so the first contact in the northern part of the Americas was uh, in this area, but in the western hemisphere, like in the Caribbean was in, in our islands, in Boriquen, in Puerto Rico. So um, 500 uh, plus years ago. So the people, native peoples in the Caribbean, the Taino, Arawaks people are coming together to reconstruct the language. Um, so people from Cuba, Dominican Republic, even like with people from Venezuela. So people are coming together to reconstruct the Taino language and it's happening right now in this era and we're learning. So we're learning slowly, but we are re definitely recovering that knowledge. Um, and beyond that, well, my first language is from in Puerto Rico, uh, Spanish. So I write in Spanish as well. Wonderful. Uh, Lynette, did you want to speak to the, the question of kind of modes of expression? Well, all I can say is that I'm not an artist, but I am a teacher. So I guess my mode of expression would be reading and writing and inspiring students to get an education so that they could achieve all they need to or want to and know that there are possibilities. I was thinking about when Morgan was speaking earlier on these trying times is that um, basically I remember something my mother once told me about how history repeats itself. And I think back 
having grown up during the times of the riots in the 60s and the student riots and how we things are coming back around full circle and now is our time to all come together as a people and it looks like we all are to lift up our voices to say no more thank you thank you (laughs) um gloria could we hear is gloria still with us would you like to unmute and ask your question Hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually um, not really a question, but I just wanted to say how much I appreciated all the artisans here today, um, you know, via Zoom. It is a new era, um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much. And I had the privilege of hearing everyone at the North American Indian Center in Boston when they had come to our center. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And I'm just so glad that I was able to be here today. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you, Gloria. You you know, uh, I want to comment on one of the ways that this is empowering. Uh, And I always invite people to to do the, what I'm, what we're doing here, to to do it with their own poetry and their their own songs, and we made a point to do this performance in a number of different uh, settings. Uh, it, it's made for the ceremonial circle around the open fire. It's made for um, a theater. It's made for um, going into churches. And I think it's really important that the churches listen to our spirituality now because these things were silenced for so many years. And a lot of spiritual and medical knowledge was lost by not allowing us to speak our languages and not allowing our voice um, and not allowing us to achieve or to be decision makers. Um, And there's an, an enormous amount that is lost. We probably had the cure for cancer, you know, but um, we wiped so many things out and just ignored it. Um, And so I want like people who see this and other people who are working on this and Waleem and Mixashan and Lynette and, and, and Marsha to think about how you can do your own versions of this or your own performances, you know, and not just for a theater, but for a backyard or, or for somebody's living room uh, where we take this power and we can bring it everywhere we go. Uh, that's one of the things I want people to take from this. Thank you, Robert. Um, I see that we're, we're running a little bit close to our ending time, and I want to make sure that we're going to end on time. I don't know. I mean, it seems like um, it seems like the various readers have had chance to share a little bit more kind of through answering some of those other questions. Was there anything else that you, um, you wanted to kind of, kind of bring to the forefront? Um, before we wrap up the program in terms of additional kind of comments on um, on the, the people that are with us today? I would like to say something, if that's okay. Um, I, I, we can't uh, close this without acknowledging the time that we are in, in the fight for Black Lives Matter. Um, so I just want to bring it forth. I want to uplift it. And I want to express that Native and Black people have very similar struggles and we should unite um, in this struggle. And many of us have both um, in, within us. So I um, want to uplift Black Lives Matter uh, movement right now and that we should support, continue to support Black and Brown businesses and Black and Brown people right now. And always. <laughs> oh, good words. Thank you, Marsha. One of the um, things happy to that say that was developed during the uh, shutdown was the building of a new recording studio, Polyphonic Studios, and some of the projects like capturing this in audio form, audio video form, or some of the projects that we're going to be working on. And um, yeah, just that, just that wonderful kind of expansion, and and 
likewise in terms of the struggles with Black Lives Matter, um, Justice Now, Justice or Else, We Are Done Dying, the various forms of the movement, these are all the things that we have to get behind. And of course, the wonderful thing is now that we have the technology like this, we can um, come forward with these kinds of projects that have always been pushed to the back burner because of the step the step forward it's not it's no longer a matter of I remember it was James Brown who said you know don't uh, you don't have to give me anything just open the door and let me get it myself well we're right now at that place where it's like nah don't I, I, you know when people are like what can we do for you you can't do anything but point me in the direction of where to get it and that's where we have to be and that that's part of that step forward with Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter means now we need to take social, political, and economic as Black people, as Native people, take stock of our own situation socially, politically, and economically. And i um, glad to have a business like that that can um, bring that kind of thing into the forefront and um, get behind the artists who, who bring those voices out and uh, help them find an audience for that voice. I, um, I just, I heard that somebody just raised their hand to ask a question. Um, would, I'm gonna just turn this over as a question to our, to our distinguished panel here. Would, do you, would you like to, would you like to take one more question and see if it could be a, a brief, a brief answer? Um, my closing comments are very quick. Anybody, I see one thumb up, anybody else? Okay, let's, all right, um, let's hear from, uh, I'm sorry, if I do it, Cassandra or Cassandra? Hi, there you go. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for my question. My question is for, um, I guess, with Marsha, because uh, also a dancer, and um, also the other artists in regards to um, teaching movement and um, what we are allowed to kind of take on and, and not appropriate and share. Wondering what your thoughts are about that and how as, 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 as Af people of the diaspora and we are just learning about the, the, the indigenous people of the islands that we come from, the Caribbean islands. Um, so I'm wondering like how much of this do we want to share with each other and learn and, and say, this comes from Peru, this comes from, you know, uh, Puerto Rico and, and those various kinds of moments. That, that's a, a, a whole forum in and of itself, Cassandra. Yeah. <laughs> Cultural yeah. appropriation for sure. Um, but I, what I, I, I wanna start with the end of your question, which is um, always giving credit for what, what you're representing. Um, so I know that when I'm teaching or when I'm teaching, I, I used to teach more before and now I'm mostly like focused on, on my company, but I always tell my company members where the movement, movements are coming from that I'm teaching them or passing on to them, um, as well as the history be, be um, attached to those movements. Um, so rather than just like picking up movements and randomly putting them in places like that, that for me feels disingenuous. Um, and I think that um, I love what you bring up because it translates to all art forms. Um, the, there, I was listening to a podcast the other day where somebody said, um, they take our, our traditions, they take our clothes and um, they don't want us, but they wanna commodify what we bring to the table and they make money out of it. Um, so um, I think it's time to, to, for, for people to really reevaluate their practices. Um, and to not take um, our traditions and commodify them, but rather to give us proper credit. And like uh, Morgan was saying, um, open up the door for other people to step out. Like there's a lot of people that have been pushed down and um, not allowed to express their traditions, but then somebody takes those traditions and makes money out of it. So like, it's time for that to, to, to stop. Um, and I really have a lot to say about this, Cassandra. Um, I really appreciate you bringing it up once again, but I'm going to let others also um, give their input on that. I'd like to, 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 to add to that. I, th I think that's extremely important that, you know, we recognize the sources that uh, this, this art comes from. And at the same time, we need to recognize that when we say American, 
we're talking about that's our culture too. You know, a lot of times uh, I, I've been working on a project called An American Song, but not The American Songbook. Because when we realize the contributions that in the past and present, that what's going on right now of Native and Black people, it's, I mean, the fact that we are, are uh, classified, not even classified, but just put in this position that we are, we also have to just step forward and, and take ownership of how we're, it's not even about reparations. We, this is, our, this is a, our country, this is our culture, and we need to uh, step up and, and claim that. And I think what's happening around the country now with the, the Black Lives Movement, people have, have been realized that this injustice that we're going through is really boils down to right back to the statue they just took down in Hartford, Connecticut, and all over the country of Columbus. They just took his statue down in Hartford, Connecticut yesterday. And that realizing that the, the origin of this, this racism and white supremacy goes right back to Christopher Columbus and that thought, the thought that someone can come here and just ignore us. And by, with that said, I just really want to emphasize, we need to take ownership of how we're, we're uh, invested in this culture we call the Americas. Wow. And I also add something to that, Mikshan, that um, the concept of America is the Americas. So right. Native Americans are not just North American Native right. people. We are in the Central, Central America, we're in South America, we're in the Caribbean. And so that's something else that, that, that people don't often think about. When you think Native American, you think, you know, we're only uh, representing North America. Um, I'm representing people from the Caribbean and Central America, um, Native peoples. So that's something else I wanted to, to uplift because there's um, that misconception when we say American, we, we don't think about the entire Americas. Right, exactly. Right. Thank you. Um, well, um, I'm so glad that um, Mixachan, are you, are you you're just oh, no. suggesting, okay. Um, I'm so glad that um, that these that we had a chance to take these questions, and that that last question uh, really kind of opened um, some great floodgates to other things that you know people felt inspired to say. And that really, I think, ended ended this on a really powerful note. Um, so I know we're we're coming really close to our, our end time. I want to make sure we're ending on time. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody and I'm going to try something new here this evening. I have a very short closing, but before, um, before that, I want to thank Robert, Marsha, Mixashan, Morgan, and Lynette for your amazing uh, performance and um, just willingness to really share so much of your own experience and um, uh, the, the strength of, of what you what you bring to the table and the conversation with with everybody here tonight. Um, I'm going to say, uh, excuse me if I don't quite get this right. I'm gonna just just learned it today. Kata patana mu, kata patana mu. Um, what I'm trying to say is the Wampanoag for I thank you all. So thank you, um, all of the presenters and all of the audience, everyone who participated this evening. Thank you, GBH, again for helping us to bring this all together. Um, before we say good night, I'd like to just remind everyone to be on the lookout on social media and your inboxes for more information on virtual events from Revolutionary Spaces in the upcoming months. Again, we've got a couple of programs happening where we're going to hear about some of these issues that have been raised here tonight just in the next month. So definitely look out for those. Um, if you're not already a member of Revolutionary Spaces or you'd like to support our work, you can join or donate anytime at revolutionaryspaces.org. Uh, follow us on social media, Revolutionary Spaces on Facebook and at Rev Spaces on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you all again. Stay safe, be well, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.